Hello and welcome to Digital Photography's i3 lecture series. We are thrilled to have Sean Perry as tonight's guest lecturer. Uh, born in Norfolk, Virginia, Sean attended Berkeley College of Music in Boston and now divides his time between New York City and Austin, Texas. He was, working, he was a working musician before turning to photography in 1996. His photographs are in the permanent collections of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the Amon Carter Museum, the Whitliffe Gallery of Southwestern and Mexican Photography, and the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas. His first book, Transitory, was published by Cloverleaf Press in 2006 and followed two years later by a second title, Fairgrounds. In 2009, he was a finalist for the Hasselblad Master's Award. His photographs have been widely published, including the New York Times Sunday Magazine, Graphics, PDN, New York Magazine, and American Photography, as well as having been exhibited in Washington, New York, California, and Texas in the United States, Hong Kong, Copenhagen, and London abroad. Sean is currently at work on a trilogy of books on New York City entitled Monolith, Gotham, and Photopolis. So please help me welcome Sean Perry to our lecture series. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming. I want to thank uh, Katrin and Tom and Jaime, of course, and all of you for braving, uh, braving the cold. I'm, I'm very excited uh, to be here. And uh, I brought a lot of work, and I kind of took the namesake of uh, these lectures uh, to heart. So I've kind of prepared uh, three things for you tonight. I have a ton of images. Um, I have some things that have inspired me that I wanted to share with you, and a few ideas that uh, those things have kind of uh, brought forward. Uh, so I guess let's just jump straight into it. Also, uh, you know, the best part of these things are always your questions. So I'm very happy to talk about anything that you're interested in the work or the craft or how they're made or anything at all. And we don't have to wait till the end to do that. So I, I thought I'd start with uh, this quote because it was something that was so inspiring to me from Paul Rand about without form there is no content and without content there's no form and how art is realized when those two forces are indistinguishable from one another. And the end of it of don't try to be original, just try to be good is something that you know, I've, I've always uh, thought about um, in everything that, that I've done. I've never felt like I had really big ideas or that kind of stuff, but if I just, if I just tried to be good, things would work themselves out. So I, I always love this quote. Uh, I thought I'd start with pictures that you know, led me to New York, and uh, transitory uh, were pictures that were made uh, in Texas of the built environment, um, kind of loosely working with themes of uh, communication and uh, how, these, how these buildings um, would animate under certain qualities of light. And I would see these things kind of driving around, and at the end of the day, there would be kind of a quality of light where these things would kind of spring to life. And it took me a long time to be able to make pictures of them that uh, reflected the way that I saw them. They, I just failed for a long time. Um, let me go back one. And this is an example of kind of what happens in my process where if I'm trying to consistently make pictures, uh, the story had started to evolve a little bit. It's not necessarily a story that I would write about or that I would communicate when people see the work, but it's kind of like a dialogue in my in my mind while I'm working, and I, I needed something that reflected kind of forward and back. And this is actually a highway that runs east to west in Texas. And what happened is when I made the image, the, what came back on the contact sheet was much more different than anything that I would have thought of on my own. And I think of these things as kind of like these pictures jump out in front of me, and then it takes me a while to try to kind of catch up to them. Let me just show you a couple more. Water tower, another, uh, another water tower. So these kind of things that most of the time are overlooked or, or kind of seem, uh, seem ugly. This one, kind of interesting in that uh, if you've ever been to Austin, it's the Zilker Christmas tree. Or um, there's a thing they have there, uh, was, I believe it was in the movie Dazed and Confused, about uh, the moon towers and a beer bust at the moon tower. So, this is, uh, this is one of the moon towers that used to light the city. I just love the way it looks so electrified. This one always made me giggle. I just picture a ping pong come, like kind of flying out of one of those. So 
So I, w I really just wanted to try to simplify these things and get down to the essence of what they were. And it kind of culminated in you know, some of the last ones that I made. And this one would kind of gave me ideas about how to move on to the next body of work that I would do. And then finally, this one, just pushing it to the point where I was trying to get the prints to sort of sing that light was behind them. Um, not so much that we were looking at a print where light was hitting and it was reflecting it, but really trying to push the printing as if light was coming behind, from behind it. And I did a small artist book um, for this with uh, tipped in prints. So the, the prints are carbon ink prints that are tipped into the pages and letterpress printed with a great book artist named Jace Graff and Cloverleaf Press. and went on to uh, have that around the exhibitions of the work. And this is an installation view from uh, Galveston. So these were the kinds of pictures that I was making that led me on to the next thing that uh, kind of grew into a series of something called uh, fairgrounds. And the, the fairground pictures were things that I was shooting for fun. I always loved rides and the mechanics of the machines, and I, I wanted to make I wanted to make pictures about them. And in the beginning, uh, they were mostly in focus. Uh, and they were shot at different places. Like, actually, this is, you know, some of them were at the Texas Rodeo, some of them, like, in parking lot fairs. Uh, they would do this thing, you know, in, where you'd be driving and they would, a carnival would come through for four or five days and take, op take over a parking lot. So when I would see those things, I would, you know, kind of stop and make pictures. And again, most of them kind of in focus. And I was playing around with, uh, you know, depth of field and stuff like that, and also little themes that were running through them. So like the flags kind of became a theme of always uh, kind of finding these little flags that decorated everything in the characters. And then I got to I got to this image, and what was interesting about this picture was I had kind of snuck on to the rodeo one year, and I wanted to make pictures of while they were building out the machines, and I. I kind of thought I could get some pictures of the uh, maybe like the the Ferris wheel or some of these things before they finished constructing them and I expected I'd have to come up with like a story and talk my way onto it but I, I made my way onto the fairgrounds easy no one stopped me and I started making pictures and I was there maybe an hour or so and someone started yelling at me I thought I was gonna get kicked off and it was one of the guys that was building something, and he was yelling at me to come over to see one of his machines that he had painted. So he was very proud of uh, this new paint job that he had given the machine. He wanted me to make pictures of it. So I went over there, and I photographed it for him, and we got to talking. And I went back over the course of that week, and seeing the guys, they started asking me to come over. And this picture came because I was on the back side of one of the machines where I wouldn't normally be able to be able to get. And shooting it out of focus, it allowed me to kind of break the scale, and these things started to turn into tin toys. Um, and that, that was one of the things that was kind of exciting about it for me. And one of my friends actually asked if I had set up one of these things on a tabletop. I have some old tin toys, and they kind of look like it. And I, I've always been someone where my pictures have kind of taught me. Like, the process of making the work and as as pictures become connected to one another and how they turn into a series has always kind of taught me about things and for this it, it was sort of the idea that instead of documenting a place I, I think one way to work is pictures can tell a story and document a place another thing that can happen is pictures as they become a group can be a passage to a place that isn't necessarily the place where you are and I that's what I wanted to do with this sort of a an entryway into the world of the machines, like a passage to their world. I always like this one, the monkeys on top of one of the basketball things. more flags. There's, there's a lot of movement in, in these rides, obviously, and usually very kinetic. And 
One of the things that I uh, ended up doing was shooting most of these uh, right near night time. Um, so there'd be a 20, 30 minute window at the end of the day that I would, that I would really try to shoot for. This is another picture that it kind of took me a while to get. I'd actually made it a year before and slightly different composition with a roller coaster in the background. But the next year, uh, this one was at one of the, I believe one of the rodeos, and where they placed the slide, it actually coincided where the sun was. So I'd seen it in a picture the year before and not been able to quite get it, and the next year was actually in the right place. And made these as uh, large prints, and then so something kind of subversive about shooting them out of focus and then printing them really, really big and having the exhibition be trying to be immersive so you felt like you were kind of in their world when you saw them. And did a small book around these where the inside is uh, offset press, like tritone printing, and the outside is letterpress printed and then hand sewn. And this is a fun, fun thing to make. The, uh, forward and back matter with uh, an interview in the back and an intro by Clint Willow in the front. So these, this is kind of where I come from and uh, trying to like kind of find a place of the things that I love and these were the pictures that essentially brought me to New York and wanting to make uh, images here. So some of the, some of the things that happened with uh, commissions, one of the one of the first assignments I got for New York Magazine was to photograph uh, the Newton Creek um, Center, right, the Waste Treatment Center. And I thought this was going to be the, the image that I made for, like this is kind of how I, how I saw it. But I also wanted, I wanted to shoot uh, color and had the opportunity to photograph uh, color. So it was one of, those, one of those things where in the process of making the work that it leads me to, uh, to learning and something new. So I shot this in color. And that led to this story for them about, um, it was an interesting story about suicide tourism and people that, I mean, it's a very difficult, uh, kind of difficult thing to photograph because people coming to different places where they wanted to end their life. Um, so there's a lot of, A, there's a lot of challenges in that, like how do you make something that is interesting about it and not just grim and, uh, and scary, um, something that's fresh. Also, how to have access at these places. You can't, this is the Marriott, I believe, in Times Square, and you, you can't really go inside and say, you know, I'm here to do a story or photograph a story about people that are jumping into the lobby. You know, they're not going to let you make <laughs> pictures there, right? So this was particularly challenging because at the Marriott, what had happened is th there's like an atrium and people were jumping from the floors, and you can kind of see the metal pieces on each of the floor and they actually put that stuff there so people couldn't jump out. And I couldn't really hang a camera through there. It was, it was one of, you know, very difficult to kind of do. So there's these elevators that run up and down and that's where the picture was uh, made. Also um, the George Washington Bridge and the Little Red Lighthouse there and the Empire State Building. The Empire State Building was an interesting thing to photograph because a storm had come through and everyone was being led off of the observation deck. And I actually got to be up there by myself for a little while, uh, which is kind of interesting. And all the fog and rain had come in. So it was very eerie to just kind of look off into nothingness. And this image wasn't published, but this is the one that led me to the picture that was on the spread of uh, being up in the elevators and then riding down and kind of shooting up into the, into the light was kind of the metaphor that happened for it. This was uh, something for the New York Times uh, Sunday Magazine uh, for Clinton Cargill. And I was very excited to make this is about, you know, one of my kind of hobbies is uh, reading about financial markets and things like that. And this was a story about a building that was in uh, crisis from the financial crisis. This is um, an image, some of the first pictures of the Barclays Center as it was being finished.
Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, I, I certainly don't want it to sound that way. Um, you know, I, I did what most of us do where I, I started by going to portfolio reviews. Um, I went to um, PhotoFest in Houston, was the first one that I did, and I met some editors there and went on to do the Santa Fe reviews um, after that. Um, and you know, one thing I should say too, I mean, it's very interesting, it, it, there's a, always a lo much longer period of time between um, that process and when the actual jobs came. I mean, the, the first assignment that I got was maybe 18 months after I had met the person that I worked for. And, you know, of course, you know, the first couple of months you're convinced that, oh, they hated my stuff, they're never going to call and all that kind of thing. But good editors will look for the right job for you, the, the, what they think is interesting. And a year and a half later, um, Jody Kwan was at New York Magazine and <coughs> she had been looking for something that she thought my pictures would be a good, uh, be a good fit for. So I was really excited to have that, you know, that kind of thing evolve in, in that way. I also, you know, do all of the things of trying to make postcards and write just enough emails that you're present and not annoying and all of those, you know, all of those kinds of things and uh, try not to say no when they ask things that are impossible and all of that. So this is, uh, this is something I did on spec recently as a, I, I designed a poster actually um, and they had seen the fairgrounds pictures and wanted something that was uh, film noir kind of in the style of the fairgrounds pictures and a film noir kind of thing and um, very happenstance lucky to get the Mini Cooper um, in the shot. I'd gone to see the theater to make pictures and happened for that. And then finally one more that I wanted to show you. Uh, this is another one that was unpublished but I, I got a, a ma an email once uh, a year or two ago asking uh, if they could run one of my pictures of the Whitney uh, for a story that they were doing and they sent over the picture and it wasn't my picture. Uh, <laughs> it's a great picture but it wasn't, it wasn't mine so I, I wrote them back that I'm, I would, I'm sure somebody would be very happy to run it. It's, it's not mine but I'd love to make one for you. I'd love to shoot the Whitney for you. So um, I went off and I made an image of the Whitney and turned it around and sent it in. I'd, they ended up going another direction, but I always, uh, I always liked that image and wanted to share it with you. So, one of the things that um, that I've always tried to do is uh, the things that I'm making in my personal work. You know, th that doesn't change when I make work for clients. And another kind of aspect of how my life works is I'm a, I'm a teacher. I've been teaching photography for. 13 years in college and before that I did seminars for uh, Photoshop and consulting and those kinds of things. And I've always tried to bring what I'm doing in my work into my classroom and then the things that happen in my classroom back out into my work as, as opposed to treating it like something that's completely separate. And you know there's a couple of, there's a couple of things that happen as, as a teacher. Uh, one of them is, as you, are, as you are evolving and you're solving problems, you start to get farther away from problems that you've solved. And when students come in, they are more or less in a similar position to that problem. So the relationship to that problem, you're at a different place. And that's, it, it's always a challenge of how to mitigate that distance. So one of the ways that, um, that I've always kind of dealt with that is, by developing this idea of themes. And they're not really assignments that, um, that the classes have, but I'll do them about once a year, and there'll be things that I'm working on or things that I'm curious about or things that I'm struggling with, and I'll put it to the class on the first day. And it's something that kind of guides us through the, the semester. And as, as we finish through this theme, the, the best parts of it move on and get reused in other ways and the parts that don't work kind of shake out and you know kind of fall away. So some of the themes from years past, one was the idea of density. I had I'd read an article of, from an urban planner talking about that the denser things are, the heavier they are. And the heavier they are, the more attraction they hold. And what he wanted to do was to build density into this downtown area 
to draw more and more people to it, that it would increase the, the attraction to the place as it became heavier. And I thought this was such a great metaphor for what we try to do as photographers in our work, is we're, we're trying to create density or trying to figure out ways to have connection of more, uh, either expanding our audience or more people to work with. Another one was uh, game theory and the idea that by reducing the choices that you have, uh, you increase the chance for success. When you, you know, it was at a time when I saw lots of my students were struggling with just too many, too many choices. And I love toys. It's not, it's not about not using technology, but about working through problems where, where you limit things in a way, it, it gives you a better probability to succeed. Uh, another one, um, quickly, like craft across disciplines. That was kind of interesting. We looked at architects and chefs and musicians, other photographers, and how they all had a very similar kind of message in that, you know, tenacity over talent and uh, the idea that their failures is kind of help what moved them forward. Uh, so it was very interesting to see that there was very commonality around people that did well or had um, had a lot of success in the things that they made. It was not so dissimilar to what we were doing. And the current one, uh, this is what what we're working through right now, is a quote from a quote from Warren Buffett. And only when the tide goes out do you discover who's been swimming naked. And I, I think it's such a great quote. And he was he was talking about real estate um, and insurance companies. Uh, this is from one of his annual letters. A uh, photographer friend of mine um, turned me on to his annual letters. They're free to download and they're very, they're very well written and lyrical. So he was talking about liquidity and the idea that when there's a lot of easy money around that everybody's in the pool and when an event happens and you know the tide goes out you kind of find out who shouldn't have who shouldn't have been there. And for our purposes, we kind of modified it to talk about the idea of prints and the idea of it's only when you make a print that you find out the bones of the image. And that right now there's a lot of liquidity in photography in that it's very easy to create images, it's very easy to share images, it, everywhere. There's so much liquidity. And when you try to make a print, when you put edges on it, when you make it real, it changes it and you kind of find out what works and what doesn't. And it's not to say that things shouldn't be online or any of that kind of stuff because I think once you've rendered a print it only strengthens how you share it or what you do in the next steps of it. But it's the idea of giving something an edge and taking it from a place where it can be changed indefinitely to something that has a life, something that, that grows. Another thing that I wanted to kind of share with you is the idea of, of what, pictures, what pictures can do. Um, and I think, as Sam Abel says, like the life of a photograph. And Friends Without a Border is uh, something that I've been very excited to be a part of. It was uh, started by Kenro Izu, uh, who was photographing in Cambodia. <coughs> and he was moved by the need for um, for medical care there for children. And he came back to New York and started a foundation and subsequently an auction that went around this to raise money. And they built a hospital. And I believe in 2011, they crossed the one million mark <coughs> of children that had um, been helped by the hospital. And I just think this is such a powerful metaphor of what, uh, what pictures can do. And a collector at PhotoFest um, is on the board, John Bennett, and that was my connection to this. So I met him when I went to PhotoFest and he invited me to be part of the auction. And this is one of the one of the pictures from that. So this is another thing that I kind of share with um, that I've shared in my classrooms about the idea of of how pictures go on to have a life and sometimes is you know, simple as people buy a photograph and they have it on their wall and something that they live with and love, or uh, in cases like this where they can go on and do something fantastic as building a hospital, which I think is really amazing. Um, this is an image that, um, that I, I gave them this year, 
of, of new work that I'm making in Japan. So that, that inspired me quite a bit, and it's something that uh, kind of turned into this little project that, that I started in uh, Texas with uh, this great woman, Catherine Watts Martinez, who I teach with in Austin. And we noticed something, there was a couple of things that were happening um, in the classroom of things that I wanted to kind of address. One of it was uh, students are very interested in um, how to move my work forward, like how do I get it seen. So we talk a lot about competitions and call for entries and how grants work and also portfolio reviews and things like that. Another thing that uh, we work on is how to talk about your work. Um, if, in the sense of if they're an artist, about the things that they have to do to write about it and talk about it, and if they're doing commercial work, how to fight for ideas with clients. You know, that, so developing like a visual language. And then also from like the Friends Without a Border thing, I, I want to kind of plant the seeds of what they can do with their pictures or what their pictures can do beyond just them trying to push forward in their career. So Catherine and I talking about this came up with this idea to, you know, the best way to learn about a call for entry is to build one. So the students created a call for entry that we send out to uh, area high schools and they write all of the, uh, the rules and regulations and how, the, how many pictures they're going to accept, what kind of theme they're going to have, all of this kind of stuff. Um, we build out extra content around it. This is, um, this is actually a talk that uh, we did with um, Ms. Avedon, which was very exciting to have her uh, speak to my class about how she looks at photographs and how she edits pictures, how to handle a lot of pictures. We got 400 entries or so on our, on our first call, so how the students work through a group of pictures and how they make selections. And then the twist of the thing is instead of just running a call for entry and kind of uh, giving away a prize, we actually recorded screencast videos for every entrant. So every student, every high school kid that had sent in their pictures, the stu my students would cut like a 60 second, 90 second video on feedback on the pictures, on how they could improve them, on what they could do to make them better things that they recognized and the idea there is to kind of build mentorship and then also you know something more than just encouragement right um, so we cut screencast movies and then threw like a little reception for uh, the high school students and the winning entries were exhibited alongside the college students and these are a couple of shots from that so that's Maddie the, the young woman that uh, won this past uh, editions thing we gave away an uh, iPad Mini, and that's Catherine. And one of uh, one of the high school students came to visit to see all of their things. So it's very exciting to kind of see the what happened in the classroom because through th again through this process of doing this of building a call for entry of how to talk about it, how to make prints uh, that would be exhibition quality. It teaches all of the things that I want to accomplish in the classes. Um, and through those projects, they're able to kind of get there. So it's a lot of fun. I'm kind of boogieing because I, I brought a ton of pictures. And uh, if you guys have any questions so far, we can, we can pause for a minute. No? OK. So. <coughs> So New York, uh, I've been photographing in, in New York for um, almost 10 years now. And it's, it's been, uh, it, well, beyond words, actually. Like, how do, you, how, do you, how do you even photograph in New York? A part of, part of me is, like, I see pictures everywhere. And it's, it's an overwhelming kind of thing. So I've, I've tried to kind of work through a, a process of the things that inspired me and then let, let the pictures kind of connect to each other and evolve. The first pictures that I made of New York are, uh, are these. And I, I've, I've called them Gotham, um, kind of picking up from the, the fairgrounds idea of how pictures can kind of give passageway to a place. And one of the things that have always kind of struck me about, 
about New York is, you know, time for me in New York is very interesting. Like when I see things, there's kind of a, a sense of it's 1950 and it's 2050 all at the same time. I, I, I feel a tension between future and past. And I wanted to make pictures about that feeling. So storefront windows. The globe was kind of interesting. It was uh, it's still in the news building from uh, I guess that's over across from Grand Central. When I came to when I came to New York to to teach in uh, in 2006 2007, I was still making I was still making pictures like this, but they started to they started to change a little bit as I spent more time here. And it's one of the things that's been kind of interesting how the earliest pictures that I made in this series are kind of the hardest ones to find now because as you spend more time, like parts of that, the door kind of closes. Yeah, I feel like I have to look for them more. I'm sorry. kind of app for this week. <coughs> so these pictures, I continue to I continue to make them. They've they've been some of my favorite. Um, making them with a normally I shoot uh, square format, um, and these um, I've actually been making with mostly plastic camera. Um, the idea of just kind of traveling uh, light and very simple. Um, being able to shoot in low light. As I made more pictures and spending more time here, uh, the pictures started to evolve a little bit and they became uh, cleaner in a way. And this was one of the pictures kind of like in what happened in the transitory series of when I make something that kind of jumps out in front of me. Um, this is Beacon Court, I guess on 50, 59th. And I, I think it's such a photogenic building. It's, it's not necessarily my favorite building uh, to, to, to be around or to, or to look at. I, I like it very much, but it's a very handsome building to make pictures of. And this was one of the things where I had an idea what would happen, but when, again, when I saw the contact sheet, uh, the way that it kind of rendered almost like a drawing uh, surprised me. And I wasn't, it took me a long, it took me a while to kind of catch up to it again. So this is what I. This is where I focus my, focus my attention of, of shooting these uh, almost like portraits. This is Astor Place Tower. In the Goldman Sachs Building. I often have uh, dialogues kind of in, in my head about what pictures um, mean and kind of themes. And part of it, um, in, my, in my process, it's almost like method acting in a way because there are things that uh, I've read about how actors, for example, when they're studying for a part in a film, that they may figure out what the, their character, their favorite brand of cigarette or you know, the, their favorite food as a kid, but it never ends up in the movie. You know? And that kind of happens with me. Some of the things 
that I'm thinking about what these pictures are or what I'm chasing. I'm not sure if it will end up in the greater story of it. it it's there, like if we're talking about it or someone's interested in it, it's kind of the things that are foundational, but they're not necessarily like how I would introduce the pictures. And one of those kind of quiet themes through these is the idea of you know, buildings as illusions or buildings as uh, meditations. I just think of Sputnik, it just reminds me of a satellite kind of looking down through the clouds. And also buildings as obstacles, um, the way that they kind of block our view or um, kind of keep us from moving forward in a way. I found that um, one thing they don't really tell you as a photographer that I that I never that I never knew was how much writing you have to do. <laughs> and unbelievable, you, know, you kind of you hear that a little bit, but I, I spend a lot of time writing, whether it's just crafting a letter to somebody, or for call for entries, or for different grant opportunities. And I, I really I like. The process, I mean, it's, it's almost like going to the dentist. You feel so great afterwards. You don't have any cavities <laughs> and things, you know. So you're, so you're so happy when that process is done, but it's something that you kind of dread. And I, I really, I bring the same, kind of, the same kind of thing into the way that, you know, I'm kind of a ruthless editor, and I'm the same thing with writing to where I try to reduce the writing to where if I pull one more word out of it, it'll just collapse. So it'll often just take me weeks and weeks and weeks to suffer through to a paragraph. But if, if I don't cheat, if I, if I stick with it, if I really just kind of you know, put my guts all over the table through it, what will happen is something will be there that will help me make the next set of pictures. And I, I think that's, a, I think that's a kind of a powerful uh, process. And one of the things that emerged for me with these was um, you know, the idea of how to talk about them. I, I struggled with this at first because I think they're portraits, but do I say they're an overview of the New York, you know, skyline? And, you know, that's troublesome because how, to, what buildings to include, and then if you don't include something, then there's an architect that's upset that that should have been in there, all these kinds of things, and that's not really the spirit of them. And where I ended up is, uh, this is new, the Freedom Tower. Where I ended up was discovering a word called uh, sinoshers, or the idea of a sinosher. And I never heard that word before. I was reading and came across it. And it's such a lyrical word. It's a, I, I really like it a lot. It's a, it actually comes, it's, comes from the stars. And it's, um, I believe, the constellation of Ursa Minor. And Polaris is the star that it's referred to. And it uh, loosely refers to the dog's tail or something that is the center of attention. So you can use it as an adjective, like she was the, the sinosher of the room. Uh, but it struck me that that's what these are, that they're the, they're the kind of the sinoshers of this place for me. They, they're kind of the beacons that kind of light this world or light what New York means to me. It came, uh, it came through editing, and I have to, it came from a conversation with uh, John Christensen, who is a sculptor who is a big influence on me. And he, um, when he's looking at my pictures, he, he has a very kind of direct way of kind of cutting through anything that is, could almost make it. I mean, that one's instantly out. Like, he, he's, he's very kind of, uh, he, he finds kind of the center of things quickly. And one of the things that we were talking about is how these pictures seem to kind of fall into different categories and how some of them were clearly illusions in the way that I was 
shooting into glass or using the idea of clouds reflecting off of different things and you get this sense of not sure where one starts and the other one begins and that kind of thing. The other part of them were as meditations and like this one would be I would say in that category where they're very majestic and um, almost as kind of a quiet meditation. We don't normally see buildings in this way either, you know, where they're completely out of contact, out of context and alone from the skyline. And the last category was um, as obstacles. Um, and it's true, you know, like especially this time of year, it's so hard to find sunlight, you know, by two or three o'clock it's over. And um, from some, I spend time in, in Texas and it's very different in that way. Like when I'm up here for long periods of time, I have to remember to make sure that I don't work inside too late one day or something. I have to go out and get sun on me, you know. So these things about them kind of being, um, being obstacles um, that either block our view or block us moving, you know, moving forward. And it's the kind of thing that once I can arrive at something like that, it helps inform me make the next set of pictures because as I'm making something it kind of gives me direction that doesn't necessarily have to be that thing but it might be and if it's not it's something else and then if it is I can bring my skill set to bear to try to make it as good as possible. This would be one that I would say almost illusion maybe an obstacle. Uh, there's something that happens with these where they turn into almost pencil drawings for me which I really love and there's there's a book, um, Metropolis of Tomorrow, I believe is, is called, by Hugh Ferris, uh, with renderings of uh, buildings. And I've been very inspired by that. One of the pictures from the Gotham series of the globe that I was talking about in the news building is, one of, is in one of his uh, renderings. And kind of back to that Paul Rand quote about form and content, I've, I've never been able to, to be in a position where I had all of these ideas and I would go make pictures. It was, it was more a thing of I'm going to go and look at the things that I love and look at the things that I'm interested in and the pictures are going to help, help me learn about that, and help me learn what they mean and what, what they are. So I, I, they kind of inform me as I go. Kind of an interesting, uh, interesting building. It's the the line, uh, the line building. Um, it's one of the most secure buildings in the country. Um, one of the things I learned is, um, I guess, it's from a period of architect brutalist architecture, is is what it's called, and it actually feels that way. It's a very brutal building. No windows. Um, it's full of. It's where all of the communications come in from overseas, and those are huge kind of air vents off the side of the thing and it's one of the few things I photograph where I actually feel intimidated. I mean I, a lot of times I feel like the grandeur of a building or buildings like kind of being heroes. Uh, this building is actually kind of intimidating. But it's really cool. And this is another one I like a lot. I would call this a meditation. It's actually 9 West uh, 57th Street. Kind of shooting into the side of it, but I love the way it almost kind of disappears. <coughs> and the Seagram's building.
This is an interesting building. This is the, the Grace building, but uh, the same architect that did 9 West 57th. So the one that is um, next to Bryant Park is the same architect as the one that's on 57th Street, kind of sisters. So once I'm kind of engaged at a point where I've made a, I've made a decent amount of the pictures and I, I kind of have a theme and I'm working, I just try to shoot as much as possible. And I don't, I don't even really look at the contact sheets sometimes. I'll just, I'll just run film and then I'll put the contact sheets away. And then a couple months later, I'll go through the contact sheets and make work prints um, and then just try to live with them for a little while. So the, once I'm shooting, it's, it's almost like as it, as a musician, when I was writing songs, I didn't want to listen to the radio. I didn't want to listen to other things too much. It's kind of the same thing like with making pictures. When I'm, when I'm shooting, I, I'll, just, I'll, just try to make, I'll just try to make them and keep moving forward. Any questions about them? Yes. Have you ever thought taking a picture, looking at a building from a bird's eye view instead of a worm's eye view? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. He's asking, uh, have I ever considered photographing the building more from like a bird's eye view, like looking down? And it, it, uh, not really. I mean, in, it's interesting. I mean, that's kind of how the, the New York Magazine job of the suicide tourism thing came around. They initially called asking if I had anything looking down. And I was like, no, I actually look up. You know, it's kind of, I just, or straight at it. Or, or straight at it. Uh, no, I never have. It, it's always been a thing where, you know, I, wor I work very simply and uh, none of it is a tripod. It's all just handheld and on the street. And um, one of the things about these things that they kind of strike me is, uh, you know, their, their majesty, you know, they, they feel kind of like heroes to me. So um, I've never really thought of shooting them more like architecturally, like trying to get up high and into the building. So I, I've kind of liked shooting into that perspective. And um, also the tension of, you know, certain line, I don't try to, I don't perspective correct. So one of the things that I'll do is where lines should be straight, I'll intentionally let <coughs> one bend or I'll let one be a little askew. And I, I like the kind of vibration or the kind of tension that happens in that way. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not sure how I would photograph them looking, how I would photograph them looking. Uh, Sean, your images have a really beautiful tonal quality running through them. Uh, it's sort of a selenium-ish mm -hmm. hue. Um, and you said they were all shot on film. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, have you, are you looking towards or thinking about shooting anything digitally in a two and a quarter format? Because the format's beautiful. Hmm. Uh, eventually. Can I repeat the question? It was so quiet. Okay. Uh, it's a great question. He's uh, saying that the tonal quality of the pictures, uh, like a selenium kind of quality and uh, traditional medium format square, and I'm shooting film, and have I ever considered shooting a, a digital format like that? Um, maybe in the future. I mean, it's still very price prohibitive. I mean, just incredibly expensive. To, I mean, I'd love to have a phase one back and to go and, and do all that, but it would you know, be a thirty, forty thousand dollar $40,000 expense. And I'm not sure that that process would allow me to improve things that I, that I'm missing like what one of the things that I've tried you know tried to kind of do with this thing like I was saying earlier with game theory is I have the same lens the same back I shoot the same film with the same filter and when something goes wrong I just have to move my feet it's me I'm the problem it's never it's never a thing where I'm not getting what I want out of the camera or I'm not getting what I want out of the result it's like I've got to see it a different way or I've got to move my body um, but I, I 
the speed of working digitally is appealing, is appealing to me. And I, I also the the next level of of quality. Seeing, uh, I don't know if any of you guys have seen it yet, but the latest Edward Bertinsky book, Water, is out, and just breathtaking. You know, absolutely breathtaking. So, yes. Aside from the portability of plastic cameras, what else draws you to them? I like, I like that they're very kind of immediate and there's not much really wiggle room. You either have something or you don't. Um, there's, not, there's even less choices to make. Um, sometimes there's not even really focus. You know, It's just about what you see and then what it gives back to you. It becomes your ability to render that and to kind of let it tell its story. Um, I like how they are, how they're light and just simple and direct. Um, and, and they have, you know, one of the things I've tried to do is honor the format that I'm, uh, that I'm working in. So when I make pictures with those cameras, those, <coughs> those pictures look like those cameras. You know, that they, they are what they are. I, I don't try to make them into something that they're, that they're not. I just let them kind of be that thing. Um, and I, I like I like that about it very much. Does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, just to follow on from something you just said, because I too noted not just the, the the physical quality of the print, but also the tones in the sky that you've gotten. And you, then you said filter. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming using an orange or a red filter for your sky tones. Yes, sir. A red filter. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then a completely different question, going back to the Texas State Fair work. Um, how how long did you do that work, the out of focus series and all the rest? How many, I mean, it's, you said one was a year later than when you first saw it. So how many years did you put into that series, just out of curiosity, Four or if or it's five. still ongoing? No, it, it, I wouldn't say that it, it, it's ongoing, though. I mean, if I get a chance to go photograph one, I will. I mean, it's just, it's a lot of fun. Um, but four or five years, uh, the beginning ones, uh, like I said, were kind of in focus. and. I never really had an intention for them to be something. They were just things that I made for fun because I wanted to be there and uh, they were just kind of cool. Um, and again, a couple of those pictures surprised me. I, I got pictures out of them that were more than I had expected. And then one kind of turns into two and if you're lucky, sometimes it turns into four and then it, it starts to become something. And the long story of it is they were kind of like the last little bit of transitory. There was, a, there was a part of transitory where these pictures kind of fell in between with the quality of light. And so it kind of led me into this, this new thing. But it was, it was over four or five years, so I finally felt like there was enough there that it became its own world. Sure. Uh, simple question, why black and white? Why black and white? Um, I think it, it immediately it immediately strips things of what they are and more about you know what they can mean and what they can feel like and what else they can be because we don't see that way and I, I, I think many photographers have that kind of idea about black and white but that's something that has always kind of drawn me to it that it, it's you know it, it's one of those things that kind of helps put you in a different a different place and I love color I really do it's it's I can't say that you know one over the other the other part of black and white that's a little bit different is the production of how black and white works um, in, in making prints in the darkroom and that process and in the beginning that was something that that I preferred over color because I was printing color and black and white but I, I much preferred what happened and what you could do with toners and things like that with the black and with the black and white work. Also, many of the pictures that have just ruined me that I've been inspired by and seen in books are from, are just, you know, kind of the great black and white pictures. So that was another part of it. I think he's going to move on. Hi. Okay. Um, what was the most surprising um, or extreme reaction, like emotionally, from the audience that has seen your photographs? Because your pictures are so s s simple, 
yet the power behind them is not simple at all. Was there any like surprising reaction that you've s received from the audience that has seen these photos? Uh, so she was asking like anyone like surprising reactions. Um, I <laughs> one one thing that's been kind of interesting is. Um, not many people know, know they've seen my pictures maybe, but they haven't met me or they don't know what I look like. And there's been a couple of times where I've been at a show where my pictures are and people are there and they don't know that I'm there, you know. So I'll go up behind them when they're talking and just kind of eavesdrop, which is it's kind of a great treat, you know. I, I highly recommend if you ever have that opportunity to do. So I, I've heard people describe how I make my pictures which is totally wrong, you know. But it's very interesting because that's what they're, you know, that's what they're seeing it. So I've, I've heard people talk about me being up in a cherry picker, uh, you know, like one of the, like, kind of lifts or whatever to make the picture or that I did this thing or the other thing. And in truth, they're much simpler than that. So that, that, part, is, that part has been very interesting to me. I, I think the other thing, too, is also not recognizing necessarily what they are and, and then finding out later. Like, uh, you know, s sharing with you some of the things about that being a Christmas tree or this building being one thing or the other. And I, I don't think it's necessarily materially important that you know what the thing is, but I, I think it's a nice surprise when you learn about that afterwards. You know, again, it's back to just, it's just the foundation of the things that there's more there's more story there if you're interested in it, but it's not the thing that I lead with, I guess, best way to say it. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask, are you, um, are you inspired by film at all? I see, maybe I'm just bringing my personal references in, but I see a lot of um, images that remind me of films that I've seen, Hitchcock with your um, Carnival mm -hmm. series specifically, um, mm -hmm. Metropolis, um, Sure. Men with a movie camera. I mean, are they? Is that something that inspires you? Oh, ab absolutely. Um, I didn't grow up around uh, any photographers other than, you know, family, and and it was, it was certainly a period with uh, Polaroids and you know, flash cubes and a lot of like kind of family pictures. And my dad used to make scrapbooks for people in the family and stuff. But my mom was a librarian, and they used to take me to work for for kind of where this is going. So I would, go to, I would go with my mom to the library on days that they didn't have a babysitter. And a couple of doors down from the library was a movie theater. So I saw a lot of movies. And films have always kind of inspired me about pictures and kind of the intersection of how uh, music and pictures come together and creates an atmosphere and a place and passage and all of that kind of stuff. I just have never had the desire to try to make films. Like, I can't even imagine what it's like to, like people that make movies and people that work in moving images, I just have so much respect for because it's just so overwhelming to me. But I've, I definitely have that aesthetic that I think has kind of come into the single pictures. Speaking about inspiration, uh, you mentioned like that some in some of your photographs, like buildings, uh, vibrate or <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, um, resonate like is mm -hmm. there is uh, it's coming from music like how do you feel that has influenced your work and I mean I see like rhythm and repetition and mm. you know breaks and so, but I'm wondering if that you know if that's an influence that you recognize and how you describe yeah sure I mean it's it's an I mean it's an interesting thing I mean also it's I think it's a very common thing with uh, with musicians and photographers I mean it's it's almost cliche to say that I'm a photographer that played music or I'm a musician that takes pictures. I mean, those things are very kind of interrelated. I, I think that um, I learned photography from music. So when I started, you know, I was looking at books and uh, trying to make prints. I was taking pictures of my friends. And so, you know, you, the, one of the first things that you kind of run into in the beginning is dynamic range or tonal range of what what are where the blacks are and where the whites are. So shadows and highlights are bass and treble, for example. And then, you know, composition about how you arrange space in the frame is no different than how you arrange notes in, in music. So these kinds of things are sort of how I see the world. So when I learn about things, 
that's kind of the metric that I, I kind of go back to all of the time. And I believe all of us have that in different ways. Like for some people it might be cooking, or for some people it might be drawing, or you know, my dad was a carpenter, so for, for him it was geometry. You know, there's, there's all these, kind, these kinds of things. So I, I've just, I've tried to tap into it, and it's not something that I consciously, you know, think about. Um, but it is something that I kind of find in the pictures. And I was telling Jaime earlier, like, one of the things that's kind of interesting is when I was making music, I tended to kind of see pictures when I hear music. And when I make photographs, I tend to hear music. And I, I even, you know, I print the music or, you know, I was saying earlier, it's not the best idea, but sometimes I photograph while I'm listening to music too loud. And it's, it's kind of fun, you know, immersive. I wanted to build on that as well. Um, when I was preparing for the talk and I, I was reading your thoughts mm. about sound and, and image, um, I had a, a small epiphany just imagining the sounds at the fairgrounds to accompany your images and that uh, really kind of brought it alive for me in a very special way, mm. uh, which is not something that I would ordinarily do, but since I read you were a musician, I. I mm. turned that the volume on on the images and it was yeah pretty exciting yeah mm, thank you thank you um, you know the thing I'm about the are beautiful for their form and content mm. but are you trying to say anything about the forces that are um, actually making these buildings hmm. the capitalism and your point of view looking up yeah, I mean, a part of me is responding to them like I'm looking at the movie The Fountainhead <laughs> or uh, Gotham City. Yep. And there's a big uh, political divide between the forces in those movies. Yeah. And I'm trying to find, like, how do you feel about that stuff? Wow, you're very insightful. Um, it is not necessarily The Fountainhead. It's actually Atlas Shrugged is yeah, where. I was going to say Ayn Rand. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 Ayn Rand. Um, it's complicated. Uh, part of it is there's there's a section in Atlas Shrugged where in the beginning of the book um, she's writing about uh, this guy smoking a cigarette and it's kind of in the beginning of the story and they're describing the city and um, the magic of a cigarette and how um, what how does she say it how how many problems have been solved as man has held fire at his fingertips? In other words, the things that we, you know, I, I don't want to romanticize smoking, but the idea of, you know, while you're smoking and contemplative, what things have been solved or what we have been able to build, right? So that has always had a big impression on me, and I've always loved the city. And so, like, when I see these things, I think, wow, we're our tiny little selves built this, you know, and when you think about New York, you can kind of flip it upside down and the infrastructure underneath everything, we've got another city underneath that as well, right? So all of those parts of it are there. So the idea of looking up and the idea of what we've been able to accomplish and the idea that these things are, you know, heroic to me, the political aspect of it isn't so interesting um, as, as a dialogue in my work. Um, I have opinions about all that kind of stuff, sure, like everybody, but it's not what the pictures, you know, are about. And I, I've never had the desire to burden my audience in that way about them. You know what I mean? So, so I, I've wanted to bring those qualities into it, but without the idea that, um, of, of where that bias is, I guess. Does that answer your question? No? Yeah? I mean, I, I try. I mean, I mean, it's a long discussion. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I guess the bottom line is, I I make no apologies that I want them to be heroic. You know, I, I want them to be beautiful. They're things that they're things that inspire me. There, there's all you know. There's a subtext too about, about these things with the built environment. And you get into this thing of, you know, man and the environment and what we're doing and all all of that kind of stuff and. There are artists that speak so well to that, like the Bertinsky book, you know, and, and the way that he works. Um, I just, I don't work that way forward. I think those things are in my work, and over time those things are conversations that I have and foundational things, but they're not the things that I lead with. We have time for one more question. 
somebody would like to ask him. Mm -hmm. I have one last little set of pictures to show you too. Can you describe your print process and I guess the evolution of how it came to be or how it has evolved over your career? Like the, the printmaking aspect yeah, of physical it? physical darkroom printmaking. Yeah, um, you know, it was one of those things again of like trying to simplify my tools and then being um, kind of inspired about prints that I was looking at. So some of the earliest um, things that kind of hit me overhead were the Starn Brothers um, and their early work of all the kind of distressed coloring things that they did. Um, also Irving Penn's uh, platinum prints because uh, when I saw those for the first time it just blew my mind because I didn't like how do you how do you go from what I'm making which is a you know feels like a snapshot is black and white at least but it feels like a snapshot to this this world of like tones and textures and things like that so it became a process of trying to simplify things in the darkroom and kind of over over developing them this is something that I uh, had read about um, about I think Penn did it with the nudes where he would overdevelop the print and then bleach back some of the tones to get at the place that he wanted to do. So that's what I tried to do in the darkroom is I would print them almost a little too dark. They would be heavy and then I would dilute the bleach to slow down uh, how fast the bleach was working and allow them to cook in the bleach to try to lift the shadows back up. And then, so there is a combination of being toned in sepia and selenium. So the sepia would kind of give me a break, which would kind of visually, it's kind of, kind of helps you with contrast because the highlights start to run warm and then to grays in the midtones. And then I would pull it from there and put it into selenium, which would kind of give more weight to the shadows and get the dynamic range back that way. So it was exposing the film as hot as I could um, without blocking up the highlights and then underexposing a little bit on the enlarger and then over developing them in the developer and then bleaching them you know so it's just constant kind of compression and expansion compression and expansion so does that make sense yeah so. and I had one last little group of uh, one last little group of pictures I wanted to show you and we can keep talking Oh, there's a couple of more we paused. Sorry. I photographed a lot of buildings. <laughs> this is one of the last ones that I've made. I'm, I'm not quite sure if it's going to end up fitting or not, but it just looked like a pop-up book to me, of like a, the pop-up city that I wanted to show you. So this last little bit, like, like all of us, like one of the things that, um, that I've done is I've kind of made little, kind of like a, a diary of, uh, places that I want to photograph and I was making them in color kind of like a little uh, a little sketchbook and I showed them uh, to Ms. Avedon and she's very encouraging about uh, continuing them and to uh, to make as many of them as uh, possible and this has kind of turned into a little a little project um, that we're involving And you know, back to this idea of you know the kind of um, letting the pictures be what they are. It would be hard for me to make this image in that other format. I mean, I I, I wouldn't really make this as a monolith picture. And I think the best for, for me, the best way to. to that I kind of describe these as I, I'm sweet on them. They're, they're things that, you know, they kind of make, they make me smile and they, they just remind me of New York so much. I forget what it's called. Is it Abaresque, that position? It's across from the it's across from the ballet. Mm -hmm. And finally, 
That's my favorite building. If I had to pick one, it would be the Chrysler building. building yeah. Mm. yeah, it's hard to beat, isn't it? Yeah, so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.